good to be here in the Lord's house with you this evening. Take your hymnals and we'll start out with number 790, God is still on the throne. Stand with me if you're able, 790, 790. <laughs> Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. 793. 793. Master, the tempest is raging. 793. Master, the tempest is raging. A bill. Back to number 530, 530, a shelter in the time of storm. 530, verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide. Shelter in the time.
532 for our last song. 532, in times like these, you need a Savior. 532. We skipped over the announcements, but nothing's changed since this morning. So uh, do you remember the ladies' luncheon coming up uh, here next week um, on the 14th? James chapter 5 tonight, if you will. James chapter 5. <clears throat> kind of a practical look of the struggles that we actually face. Questions that we actually say to ourselves, maybe, that maybe we don't say them out loud, but the struggles that we, we have here concerning patience. James chapter 5, picking up in verse number 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults 
one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. A lot in this passage. We certainly won't be able to deal with all of it, but uh, looking at the aspect of patience and faith tonight. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your love for each one of us. Thank you for the privilege to be able to come together this evening and gather in your uh, uh in your house, in your presence, uh, as a body of believers, as a, uh, a family, uh, Lord, thy family, sons and daughters of thine. Be glorified, Lord, uh, as we worship you, uh, and uh, may we learn something new, may we draw closer to you this evening, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have you ever looked at other people and thought, I wish I had it together like she does? I, I wish I had faith like he does. I wish I had patience. I wish I had that, that buoyant and positive attitude that he always has. Uh, they, they, um, they just must be a spiritual giant. They must be successful in their prayer life. Uh, but me, I, it seems as though my prayers bounce off the ceiling. It seems as though I don't get anywhere. It seems like a waste of time. But those people... It must be nice. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I do. It's like, why, why is it that, that, that it works for them and it doesn't work for me? You know, social media hasn't helped this aspect of our lives. People post their perfect moments. And, uh, and we get this idea that everything's per uh, perfect. And Spiritual people uh, post their spiritual victories, and, and you and I end up in the depths of despair because that's just not my experience. My experience is a lot of failure and a lot of just hanging on and a lot of just making it through the day again. And, and sometimes being angry at God and trying to hide it. And... and and sometimes going days without reading the Bible and sometimes being discouraged uh, by going to church instead of, by being, instead of being encouraged by going to church. Just trying to be practical here. The thing about faith is it grows. You know, self, the salvation um, is, is a gift. Uh, salvation, the, the, the saving grace is is a gift but faith is not a gift faith grows day by day we want immediate faith without the tests and the trials lord i can handle it uh, you just give me faith and, and i can handle this i don't need those tests and trials but faith grows in the tests and the trials and, and we can look at others and say i wish i had her faith or i wish i had his faith but I guarantee you, you don't, wit, don't wish for the troubles that brought that faith. James says in, in James chapter 1 and verse 3 and 4, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now he explains there uh, by saying wanting nothing, that he's not saying sinless perfection. He's saying mature, a spiritual maturity. Um, I had never heard of Dureko uh, winds before I moved to Indiana. Uh, I've never, I'd never heard of that name. I didn't learn about it in science. Um, we, we didn't have them in the other places that we had lived, but we have experienced their force several times since moving to Indiana. Now, my wife and I had, uh, have planted several trees on our property to include five maple trees on the front lawn. 
Four of them did well. We had to replant one last year, and so it's this little, uh, little slender um, uh, uh, maple tree. And, and um, during the last storm, those trees took a beating. I tell you what, they, they bent over, and, um, and, and the, the force of the wind was the, those little leaves were flying off that tree, and, and it was bent over almost to the ground. And my wife had her face up to the dining room window, and she was saying, hang on, little tree. Hang on. Hang on. The storm won't last forever if you could just hang on a little bit longer. Uh, uh, don't break. You can do it, you know. The trying of your faith worketh patience. There were other trees in the yard that were 20 times as big, and withstood the force 20 times as, as, as that little tree. But it was that little tree that was bending over because it had little strength. And um, we weren't so worried about those other ones, even though they were taking 20 times the force of the wind because they had been through that storm before. They didn't seem so bothered. And so it is with faith. The stronger your faith, folks, the bigger your problems and the bigger the force that comes against you. And you say, you know, so-and-so doesn't even seem to be bothered by such and such that came in his life. He must have great faith. He's also had great problems. The big tree doesn't seem to bend like the little one, but I guarantee you the force of the uh, of the gale or, or the wind was felt. And by the way, that little tree did survive. Um, it, it survived and, and uh, only to be whacked by the frost and lose all of its leaves. You know, last spring we had that, uh, that warm spell and, and the buds came out and it was doing really good and then the frost came in and just whacked it. And we thought, well, there goes that one. But it budded back out again and it's still doing all right. But uh, nonetheless, faith is a lot, a lot like the roots of a tree. It, 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 you can't see the roots. You can't see the roots. But the deeper those roots go into the soil, the more stable the tree will be through the storm. Roots don't grow overnight. That's a process. It's a process of growth. Uh, they come slowly. They, they, they grow toward the water source. They, they grow toward the nutrients. They grow to produce stability as the, uh, the tree above the ground is, is, is shaken, and, and as the storms come in our lives, our faith goes deeper. Our faith depends less upon, upon the, the, the surface blessings, if you will, and, uh, and more on the deeper things of God. Romans chapter 5, turn over there if you will. I think we, we can do that. Romans chapter 5, we see... This concept, Romans chapter 5, uh, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Okay, so that's talking about the stability and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Oh, I wish the Bible didn't say that. <laughs> But it does. We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And when we, when we face the greater and greater storms, if we allow God to do his perfect work in our hearts, we will find ourselves visibly less and less shaken and less and less bothered by the trying of our faith that worketh uh, patience. The message that James is sharing here is how to have patience. And he establishes that several times in these verses. In, in verse number 7, he, he says, be patient. In verse number 8, be ye also patient. In verse number 10, uh, we have uh, end of patience, the last word there. Verse number 11, uh, you have heard of the patience of Job. And so he is, he is uh, teaching us uh, patience, how to be patient. Don't rush through life 
jumping from this and jumping from, uh, from that uh, because it got uncomfortable or because it didn't seem to be working out the way you thought it was going to be working out. Faith doesn't, uh, doesn't come overnight. It takes patience, uh, a patient focus on that long-term goal. And, and the Lord gives us that long-term goal here in verses 7 and 8. It is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get your, your, your eyes on the sky, so to speak. Get, get your, your, your focus on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the hope that the Apostle Paul is talking about in, in Romans 5 as well. You know, to illustrate this truth, James uses that illustration of the husbandman, of the, of the farmer who, who uh, plants these little trees and creates an orchard and uh, is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. And it's a beautiful picture of patience because of how long a farmer has to work before he, he reaps the fruit of those, of those trees that he has planted, sometimes several years uh, uh, 10, 11, 12 years sometimes before he gets really any fruit to speak of, let alone a return on that uh, big investment. But in the, uh, in, the, in the early years, the young trees have shallow roots and they, they depend on that uh, surface blessing, so to speak. The, the early and latter rain, verses, verse 7 says, and... Uh, as they grow and as the roots get deeper, they, they find a more stable source uh, of water. They find a more stable source of nutrients, and, and, they, and, and, and that will supply them during the, the times of, of, of drought, during the hard times, as well as give them stability in the time of storm. Andrew Murray was a, a preacher of years gone by. And uh, he uh, told a story of a grapevine, a large grapevine that was in Hampton Court in, in London. And uh, it always bore uh, really good fruit. It, 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 it would, through the drought, produce bunches of grapes, sometimes thousands of bunches of grapes, a large uh, a grapevine. And, uh, and all of the other ones seemed to experience drought and, and would wither up in, in the, the dry times. But this one uh, grapevine would, would, would always produce fruit. And so they followed the, the root of this uh, vine. And uh, most grapevines have uh, routes, roots that are, are like uh, 30 feet, 32 feet long. And that's really quite long considering the size of a vine. Uh, but this root... Um, stretched all the way over from Hampton Court to the, to the River Thames, which was over 300 feet away. And it had embedded its root system in the rich soil there along the, 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 the riverbed of the Thames, and it never ran out of, uh, of water. Um, and, uh, you know, this didn't happen overnight. This happened over, uh, over a long period of time of that of that vine desiring the water and going after the water and doing something that everybody would have considered impossible. Uh, it's impossible for a, a grapevine to have a root 300 feet long. They only grow 30 feet long. Uh, but the desire was there and, the, and, and the, that root system grew until it could not be, um, uh, it could not uh, suffer uh, during the, the times of drought. And James says here, in, uh, in chapter 5, establish your heart. Get established. Send those roots out. Uh, get established in faith. Get focused on the hope of the Lord's return, yes. verses 7 and 8, and, and, and allow that to change the way you look. Yes. Uh, maybe I should say your outlook. Uh, allow it to change the way you live. You know, an, an impatient farmer is not going to wait for the coming of the fruit of that orchard. He's going to get discouraged, and he's going to allow those, uh, those, those, those uh, trees to go unpruned, and, and he's not going to mow the orchard, and he's not going to tend to, to the, the support system of the young tree, and he's, a, he's not going to replace those trees that, that fall over in the wind or whatever it may be. And so he will never, um, uh, never enjoy the fruit of that, uh, that, that faithfulness that was developed. Patience is learned as we day by day tend to the problems of life 
with a constant focus on the fact that one day it will be worth it all. One day our Lord will come. One day he will come and take us home. And that day, James chapter 5 and verse number 8 says, draweth nigh. Yes. That should be our focus. That should be our hope. And, and uh, the Lord speaks of a man uh, that has established his heart in him in Psalm number 1. Psalm number 1. If you will turn back to Psalm number 1 with me, we have, uh, I, I know Doc has, uh, has uh, uh, put this to, to memory, but we have the, the blessed man uh, here in Psalm number 1 with the established heart. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Well, whether he is walking or whether he is uh, standing or whether he is sitting, he is established in his faith. He is not listening to the ungodly. And the ungodly are those who just don't consider God in any of their decisions. He, he does not listen to the ungodly. He does not uh, listen to the sinner. Those who are, are the, the sinner uh, compared to the ungodly, the sinner is that one who knows what God says and says, I'm not going to do that. And he does not listen to the scorner, those who fight against God, those who hate God and, and are determined to uh, make fun of him or whatever it may be. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. You know, in this day of entertainment, um, the Bible is often deemed boring. Yeah. <laughs> It is often seen as boring, and it will not hold the attention of many. But those, uh, for those who read it and heed it, it shall uh, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. None of this is true for the person who won't get to know God and read His Word. Does the tree by the river endure the same uh, storms as the tree that's further up uh, the coast or, or upland? Sure it does. It, it, it endures the same droughts. It endures the same winds. Um, but it has a source of nourishment that cannot be taken away. And that's what the, the Lord is comparing the, the man here in Psalm number 1. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Faith and patience walk hand in hand. Faith and patience, that waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord's will, waiting on the Lord's way, uh, uh, and, um, and on his time, they walk hand in hand to, to, to produce that established heart. Psalm number 27, uh, verse number 13 says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You notice that he, he doesn't say, wait on the Lord, and the Lord will speed up this process and get you out of this storm. It doesn't say that at all. God's timing is perfect. God's timing does not change. He doesn't say that he's going to start, uh, stop the storm. He, he says, stop getting worked up about the storm. Have a little bit of godly courage. Have a little bit of faith in, in the Lord. Have a little trust in his word. And stop getting worked up and watch the Lord strengthen your heart in that trial. Watch that trial no longer bother you. Watch that trial no longer work you up and, and cause you to fret. First, uh, or not first, but um, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. You know, both of these passages, Psalm uh, 27 and, and, and uh, Isaiah 40, um, are talking about the strength that we gain when we wait upon the Lord, when we learn patience uh, through faith, through continuing. 
I, I read a verse. I was reading. I re- read through uh, Jeremiah here. Uh, this uh, I th- it was in the uh, in the uh, month of August, anyway. Um, but um, I, I, I came upon this verse. Jeremiah was uh, seeking the Lord. And it says in Jeremiah 42, verse number 7, And it came to pass after ten days that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying... And that just kind of stuck out to me. You know, Jeremiah came to the Lord, and he had this urgent need, and he wanted an answer to prayer right now. And and, and the Lord said, that's not my timing. I'll answer you in ten days. (laughs) And, 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 uh, you know, we have to understand, and we have to trust, and we have to have patience... In God's timing and realize and rest in it. And, and, and uh, that's what patience is all about. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You know, <clears throat> I got to tell you the truth. There are times and there are days when I have to keep my mouth shut because all that's coming out is complaining and griping yeah. and murmuring. And sometimes we even blame God for the things that have gone wrong, or maybe I should say the things that we perceive as having gone wrong. But the problem with complaining and griping and murmuring uh, uh, is the person that gripes and and, and murmurs, he, he fails to see God's hand in anything, and so they go through the same storm, but they don't get any benefit from it. You still go through the same storm. You know, you think of Moses and and Joshua uh, and the children of Israel. Moses and Joshua suffered the exact same uh, lack of water and lack of uh, food that the rest of the children of Israel did when they were griping and complaining. And maybe Joshua and, uh, and, and, and uh, Moses suffered more so than the rest. I don't know. But, uh, but they went through the same trials and the same testings of the Lord that everybody else in the children of Israel went through. But, but Moses and Joshua were the only ones that got the benefit from it because everybody else was murmuring and complaining. They didn't get any benefit out of that trial. They, they became more bitter. But Joshua and, and, um, and Moses became strengthened and they became established. That's what James is talking about. James gives us two more examples uh, here in, in chapter... Got to get back to the book of James here. Uh, in chapter 5, he gives us two more examples. He gave us the husbandman to begin with here. But he gives us two more examples of the prophets. Uh, the first one being Job. He, he says in verse number 10, Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. A very, very, uh, a, a very important phrase there, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. <clears throat> One thing that the, uh, the uh, Pastor James is teaching us here about patience is that we should look to the end of the trial instead of the present circumstances, instead of our present hardships and, and there our present discomfort, he says, Ye have seen the end of the Lord, speaking of of Job. God's design is not to destroy us. He loves us. We're told that over and over again. And if we can can get a hold of that, the love of God, we we won't believe that uh, he is doing something out of spite or out of hate or, or whatever we might accuse him of. Trials are not forever. There is an end, though when we're in the heat of it, it, it doesn't seem like there is an end. It is said of the Lord in, in Hebrews chapter 12, who for the joy that was set before him endured. That's the same concept that we have here. He, he says that you've heard of the, uh, of the brethren, the prophets who have endured. Uh, we count them happy, which endure. Job didn't just have a bad day or a bad week. He had some horrible things happen to him. He lost his children. This is not a a, a light thing. Um, But when we look to the last chapter and see the place of God, of blessing that God prepared for Job and that God designed for Job, 
we can be encouraged. You know, it's easy to read the book of Job uh, or the story of Job and, and really not let it sink in what Job actually went through because we already know what chapter 42 says. Uh, it, it's easy to say, oh, well, hang on, Job. It's, it's going to get better. But it's not easy in our lives when it's not getting better. Or, or the, uh, the life of, of Joseph. You know, when reading the life of Joseph, it's easy to brush over the fact that he spent 13 years unjustly as a prisoner and as a slave. 13 years. You think uh, your 13 years of school was hard and long. That was J jo jo Joseph's schooling. It, it was hard. It, it was long. 13 years. But translating that reality into our lives isn't so easy when we're going, when we're in the middle of the trial. I've been suffering in this trial and I've been praying for the Lord to take it away and it's been three days and he hasn't done anything. And we, 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 uh, we get discouraged. And James is saying, stop focusing on the present. Look to the end. Look to the end. That's, that's, that's what Job, Job was left with nothing but faith in God. That's all he had left. Everything else was taken away from him. And we need to start looking to the end, what God wants to do through all of this. Look to the joy set before us and endure that cross. In verse number 12, he says, be careful what you say when you're going through trials. And that's what basically what he's saying is, you know how many times I have tried to bargain with God when I'm going through a trial? Lord, if... if if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. And, and, and what James is saying, don't, don't do that. That's not what God's looking for. God, God doesn't want your bargain. He doesn't need your bargain. He wants you to grow. He wants those faith roots to go deeper. He wants the, uh, your, your, your little tree to get stronger. He wants to increase your faith, and he wants your patience to grow. And if you read through the whole book of Job you very quickly notice that he wrestled with a lot of questions. There, there, there are, are more questions in the book of Job than any other book of the Bible. Why? Because there was big trials. There was a lot of, uh, of trouble. And so Job had a lot of questions. Uh, it's not so much that a person of faith doesn't struggle. We do struggle. Uh, anybody who has faith struggles, but the person who acts in faith turns to God in that struggle and realizes where the, the strength comes from, realizes the source of strength. You know, Job was glad that his friends came, and he enjoyed at least seven days of them coming because they didn't say anything for seven days. Uh, but, uh, but he didn't go to them with questions. He, he had a lot of statements for them, and and some of his questions were directed at them, but he wasn't really asking them. He took his questions to God. What is it that James told us to do concerning the trials in, in, in the first chapter? He said, count them all joy. Thank God for your trials. Has anybody done that ever? I mean, I know we're supposed to, but I, 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 um, I struggle with that. He says, seek God's wisdom during your tri tri trial. Any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. God wants to give you that wisdom. And here in, in chapter 5, he says, look to the end of your trial in verse number 11. In, in verse number 12, he says, don't, don't start making promises to get out of your problem. That's not why the problem came in the first place, so that you would start bargaining with God. Uh, he, he says, don't forget to humbly pray and confess to God and to others in the times when, when you've not acted in faith, in verses 13 through 36. And then in, uh, he, he continues in verse number uh, 17 with another example of a prophet. And so we've had the husbandmen, we've had Job, and now we've had, we have Elias. Of course, this is Elijah. The Old Testament um, name, pronunciation of the name, or writing of the name is, is Elijah, uh, whereas the New Testament says Elias. 
But God gives us the example of Elijah um, because Elijah is the opposite of Job. And, and God wants every one of us to know that we can have this patience. We can have this growth of faith. Elijah was a man of extremes. He was, he was rough and tough. He, he, uh, he looked like a woods, woodsman, but he, he preached like a, like a prophet. He, he was a man of extremes. He, he, verse number 17 says he was subject to like passions as we are. And yet this, this guy who, who would rather uh, do something and repent of it later, uh, he learned patience. He learned to wait on the Lord for three and a half years. Do you know how hard it would have been for Elijah, a man of activity, to sit beside a brook? <laughs> I just can't imagine it. Uh, he, 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 that just wasn't his personality, and yet he learned how to wait on the Lord. He learned how God operates, and let me tell you how he learned how God operates. He learned how God operates by getting to know God. You say, how do you know Elijah read God's word? Because of how he prayed. The way he prayed was the way God said he would act. We know that he, he, he must have gotten his, his prayers from the word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 11 and in Deuteronomy chapter 28, God spelled out how the succession of, of punishments that would come upon the land of Egypt if they turned away from him. And, and there was a section, I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 28, I haven't read it recently, where there's uh, seven, um, uh, seven punishments increasingly worse and worse until they finally end in dispersion and, and slavery, uh, where God will, will, uh, will um, judge Israel if they turn uh, aside from him and serve other gods. And I believe that this is the fourth or the fifth judgment in that group of judgments where the Lord says that he would, he would uh, turn the, the, the sky as brass and the, and, and the, the uh, earth as iron or something like that. And, uh, and, and he would hold off the rain um, and the land would not yield her fruit. And the reason that Elijah prayed so fervently is he already knew the mind of God concerning this. Israel had turned aside. They had gone to idols. They were an idol-worshiping nation. And, uh, and, and Elijah said, Lord, this is what you said you would do it. Do. Do it. This, this is, this is uh, our opportunity to turn the nation back to you. Um, and so, you know, the significant thing about the, the land of Israel with the elevations and all of it, all of that, um, with its lack of, of, of rivers that, that spread uh, wide and had tributaries, is they were, they were heavily reliant upon the rains. And so when the rains stopped coming, uh, everything stopped. They didn't have the, the grain for the, uh, for the, for the um, cattle and, and so on. It just They were so heavily reliant upon the blessings of God. Now, where was Elijah in all of this? Suffering right along with the rest of them. <laughs> you got to realize that when Elijah prayed for a drought, he went through the drought too. But it didn't seem to shake him because he had a source. God said, go in uh, by the brook Cherith and, and I'll feed you. And the ravens started bringing him food. You know, sometimes it's humbling to accept the provision from where God gives it. Now, what one of you would have wanted to take some meat from a scavenging old raven? I mean, they pick through the garbage. Uh, they, they, they pick it all apart. And, and, uh, but God, that was God's provision. God supplied. And then it was a, a widow in an enemy land that supplied the remainder until the judgment was done. When God... Uh, one thing God wants us to see in the time of trouble is what the world calls impossible is not only possible with God, it's no problem. <laughs> it, it's not a problem at all. He can easily provide. provide. Uh, but uh, it's in his time, always. And it will only happen if our eyes are lifted to him and our mouths are open 
uh, in praise and in prayer. Once again, we see the source of our confidence is found in God alone. And so I want to leave us with the question, can you trust God? I, I, I know we can say we can. Every one of us here would raise a hand and say, yes, I can trust God. But really, can you trust God? If you went through the trials of Job and Elijah, can I trust him when I prayed uh, for, for something with all of my heart and it didn't happen? Job prayed for his children every day. That if they had said something, if they had uttered something, if something they had done had, 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 had uh, brought shame to God's name, that God would forgive them. Amen. Can I trust him even when I lose my health? You know, the thing about becoming a Christian is this. When I ask Jesus Christ to save you, Save me, I became his. This, this, this body is no longer my body, it belongs to him. It's his to control. Can I trust him when I don't like what I'm going through? Can I trust him when he answers one prayer the way I want it, but he chooses not to answer a prayer, another prayer the way that I want it. You know, if you look in the life of Elijah and on Mount Carmel, um, it, God answered his prayer to send fire and to, and to lick up that water and to consume the sacrifice. And God answered his prayer in a mighty way to brought a uh, rain like Israel had never seen before. And, and God answered his prayer, gave him strength, and he girded himself together, and he ran in front of Ahab's horses, and, and he got there, and he was standing in front of the, uh, the gate of, of Jezreel, waiting for, for, for Ahab to arrive with his horses, and, and he was expecting uh, God to answer his prayer to bring Israel back to him. But God didn't answer that one the way Elijah wanted it. And instead of uh, uh, Elijah receiving respect at the door of Jezreel, it was slammed in his face. And Elijah went into a pity party. And it took God a month and a half to get him out of it. Can you trust God? Can you trust God when the devil and his children are laughing at the fact that something you've been praying for for 30 years hasn't happened yet. You know, oftentimes, when we're going through a time like this, some trial, some health crisis, whatever it may be, the Bible stays closed and we open the computer because Google gives faster answers than God. There's only one problem. Google can't, contain, uh, can't carry you through the storm. The book of James is about truly learning to get to know God in our trials and, and teaching us to wait on him and live satisfied in him. Like Job, even if we lose everything but God himself. Can you trust him? Can you wait on him? Can you have patience? You know, we, we either have two options, and the children of Israel had this option. We can either give up because of our present conditions and say God's not fair, and from then on the devil can toss us around however he wants Give us fits of instability. Or we can cry out to the Lord in prayer. Get into his word and learn what it means in Psalm number 37, verse 7. To rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. Help us to learn patience. 
Lord, I pray for your blessing as we move into the uh, part of the service, the Lord's Supper, where we uh, show our appreciation for the shed blood and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was given for us. Lord, be glorified in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll take a couple minutes for prayer. Ask the pianist to play 534, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. The Lord has spoken to your heart about something. Be tender before him at this time.